Welcome to episode 122 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent writing crime fiction inspired by true crime FBI cases. Today, we get to speak to retired agent Jerry Williams, who served in the FBI for 26 years. During most of her bureau career, she worked major economic fraud investigations, targeting financial crimes and corruption. In this episode, Jerry Williams reviews the foundation of New Era Philanthropy Investigation a $350 million Ponzi scheme perpetrated against unsuspecting nonprofit organizations, high-profile philanthropists, and beneficiary donors, which resulted in a 12-year prison sentence and multiple forfeitures. The case and Jerry Williams were featured on the CNBC show American Greed. The episode was titled Confessions of a Con Man. Jerry Williams received a United States Attorney Award for Distinguished Service for her work on the New Era Philanthropy case, as well as two other United States Attorney Awards, one for an international advance fee case and the other for a business-to-business telemarketing fraud investigation. Towards the end of her FBI career, Jerry Williams was appointed as a spokesperson for the Philadelphia Division of the FBI, taking on the responsibility of educating and informing the media and the public about the Bureau. Post-FBI retirement, Jerry Williams served as the spokesperson and director of media relations for SEPTA, Philadelphia's public transportation provider. Both positions often placed her in the spotlight in front of local and national news media. Jerry Williams is the author of two crime novels. Her recently published novel, Greedy Givers, was inspired by the foundation of New Era philanthropy investigation discussed in this episode. Yes, Greedy Givers is now out and available at Amazon.com as an ebook and trade paperback. I will talk more about the book at the end of the interview, but I do want to take the time right now to thank each and every one of the members of my advanced reader team for helping me launch the book by reading the book in advance and posting their honest reviews. Reviews help readers find good books. So I guess you're wondering to yourself, is Jerry going to interview Jerry? No, that would be weird. That would be twisted. Instead, I have asked my podcasting friend, Dina Marie, to interview me. Dina Marie is the host of Twisted Philly, a podcast dedicated to her favorite things about Philadelphia and Pennsylvania at large. She talks about things from the mundane to the macabre, mischief, mayhem, and nefarious going-ons in the Philadelphia region. Dina Marie tells stories about true crime, haunted history, cool and creepy places to visit, Philly legends. Who knows what she'll get up to in Twisted Philly. The podcast is available on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, and all the other popular podcast apps. Dina Marie is also the moderator of a panel that I'll be on at Podcast Movement about producing and hosting a true crime podcast. Actually, this episode is part of our collaboration for Podcast Movement. Dina Marie is going to take the same information, the audio, and create a more journalistic narrative episode so that we can compare the two styles of true crime podcast, interview-based and storytelling. In case you don't know, Podcast Movement is the world's biggest podcasting industry meetup. More than 2,000 podcasters and wannabe podcasters will be coming to Philadelphia at the end of July. Official dates, Tuesday, July 24th through Thursday, July 26th. If you're attending Podcast Movement, please check out our panel, The Women of Philadelphia True Crime Podcasting, 
to be held on Thursday, July 26, from 1.15 to 2 p.m. So thank you, Dina Marie, for helping me finally share my FBI story with everyone. After you listen to this episode, I hope you'll check out Twisted Philly Podcast. All right, we're almost there. Before we get to the interview, I have to tell you that I recorded this episode one week early because if everything goes as planned, if you're listening to this the week it's supposed to come out, I am in Raleigh, North Carolina with my daughter Dana and her husband Sean and their new baby boy, Carter who is due on June 24th, my first grandchild. Since I'm sharing more personal things about myself than I ever imagined that I would, let me tell you that I plan to be in the delivery room when that baby arrives and that it will be an extremely emotional experience for me because it will be the first time ever that I was in a delivery room or participated in the birth of a baby. Yep, that's right. My three kids were adopted as infants. So this will be my very first time witnessing the birth of a new life. Even as I speak now, I am emotional. I can't wait. Usually my monthly emails are about the FBI and books, TV and movies. But in my July email, there will also be a post about this experience. And also in that email, I will tell you more about the birth announcement giveaway, announcing, of course, the birth of Carter and of Greedy Givers. So I'm going to be sponsoring another one of my great giveaways where you're going to have the chance to win some incredible FBI swag. So if you're interested and you're not already a member of my reader team, please sign up by going to my website, jerrywilliams.com and signing up when you see the pop-up. There'll be more information about what you need to do to enter the giveaway in that July reader team monthly email. Wow, this is a long intro. One last thing. Don't forget to subscribe to FBI Retired Case File Review on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app. Thank you. Now, here's the show. Good afternoon, Jerry. Hi, how are you, Dina? I am doing very well. How are you? Excellent. I have to tell you, I am so very honored to talk with you this afternoon and to have the opportunity to interview you for FBI Retired Case File Review. Well, I have had a lot of listeners say, when am I going to come on my own show to review a case? And, you know, I never could figure out how I would do that. And then I thought, we have this fantastic podcast here called Twisted Philly, and I have a case from Philadelphia that's kind of twisted. And I thought, well, this will be great if I have Dana Marie interview me about the case. So here we are. You are entirely too kind, and I will agree. The case that we're going to talk about is absolutely twisted. And I know you have your own incredible story as an FBI agent, but one of the things that you do and do so well on your show is really give your guests, the retired special FBI agents, an opportunity to talk about some of their most compelling cases. And when you reached out to me and told me what the case was that you wanted to share with your listeners, it may sound strange to say I was excited because it is very twisted and had a hugely negative impact on our city. But nonetheless, I was excited because knowing that you had a connection to this was just so surprising and at the same time, not at all surprising because your years in Philadelphia working as a special agent with the FBI, your focus was economic crime and corruption, things like Ponzi schemes, which is what we're going to be talking about today. I don't want to steal your thunder, though, because you are the expert in this. So Jerry and I are going to be talking about the Foundation for New Era Philanthropy, which sounds as if it would be something wonderful, doesn't it, Jerry? Absolutely. And everybody thought it was wonderful. But as you'll find out, and this is something that Jerry has many, many years of experience with, in the city of brotherly love, folks are not always out to support one another from a place of affection. 
They're actually there with their hands out looking for a free ride and looking for a way to scam other folks. Jerry, how did you get connected to this case? What was your introduction to and then the investigation around this? Well, for many white collar crime cases, we learn about it from an informant, you know, a cooperating witness. But I have to admit, the case even started off twisted because the FBI learned about this case from the newspaper. That's right. The foundation was being audited at the time. Yes, they had had a major loan with Prudential. They had a $45 million loan with them. And it wasn't being repaid on schedule, so Prudential did a margin call. And once they went in to to take a look at the finances, they realized that there was no money there, no ability whatsoever to pay $44 million. And so immediately, the lawyers for the Foundation for New Era Philanthropy put the foundation into bankruptcy. And that's what we learned. On the morning of May 16, 1995, the headlines of the Philadelphia Inquirer said, a bankruptcy shakes the world of charities. And that's the first time we learn that there was a potential criminal case here and that it looked like a Ponzi scheme. Now, for folks who may not be familiar with that phrase, Ponzi scheme, what is that? Well, the scheme is named after Charles Ponzi. And the truth is that most people think a Ponzi scheme is always initially a fraud or a scam. But in reality, for most of the time, a Ponzi scheme develops from a business, a legitimate business that starts to fail. And in desperation, the owner of that business starts to look for money to keep it afloat. And by doing that, they bring in new investors to a failing business. And in order to make everybody happy, they have to pay off their initial investors. And they do that through the money they bring in with the new investors. So it's just trying to get more investors and more investors to try to keep this failing business afloat. Now, there is not enough money in the world that will keep a true Ponzi scheme afloat. They all fail at the end because you just can't keep finding new gullible people to invest in your business. So that's what a Ponzi scheme is. It's where you try to keep a business afloat by paying initial investors from the money that you get from new investors. Thank you for that. Now, by the time that you and the FBI saw that headline in the local Philadelphia papers, this scheme had been running for about six years. And Jerry, you mentioned that typically it starts with a business owner. In this case, we would call him a founder, and that was John G. Bennett, who was a Christian businessman, somebody who presented himself to the community as a philanthropist and someone who was looking to support, encourage, and further fund other nonprofit, philanthropic, and Christian-related organizations and associations. So you see the headline in the newspaper. You realize there's something happening here in the city of Philadelphia How do you get involved? How does that investigation then begin after you see the headline? Well, basically, I go to my supervisor and I say, did you see this? (laughs) I mean, that's it. And it's so it's really that simple. It's really that simple. And, uh, you know, quickly we make a call over to the United States Attorney's Office and myself and one of my uh, partners on my squad, I was on the Economic Fraud Squad, we went over to the U.S. Attorney's Office to kind of sit down and look at it. Now, we're lucky because we already have the bankruptcy court and we have the Security Exchange Commission, the SEC, looking into the matter. So we can sit down. It's a civil matter. Uh, we can sit down with them and find out what they have. And the more and more we looked at it, it did indeed appear to be a Ponzi scheme. You know, Bennett, I think for years he was able to fly under the radar because he dealt in smaller denominations, smaller donations. And from what I understand, and now keep me honest here, he would connect with donors and under the guise of if you donate $5,000 or if you donate a certain amount of money to the, to the new era for the foundation for new era philanthropy, we will be able to take that money and double it because we have anonymous donors 
who also want to make contributions to other organizations throughout the city. So the money you donate will be doubled because someone else is going to match it. Yeah. And you know, when you look at it just on the surface, it doesn't sound as ridiculous as it really turned out to be because there is matching funds. Com- right. Companies do it all the time, allow you to, to choose a charity. And if it's one of the ones on their list, they will give you matching funds towards that because your company wants to encourage you to give and for you to support the community. And so, you know, a matching fund concept is not really, you know, that strange. But let me back up a bit because I want to tell you a little bit about Bennett and why he was so trustworthy. He actually started off as a drug counselor. He worked for the state of Pennsylvania. He was very good at counseling drug addicts. And, you know, he really developed a reputation of being able to work with different drug centers and get them funding and and help them help other people. He went from that to actually working side by side with nonprofits because this was during a time in the late, in the late 1980s where the federal government stopped providing grants. Uh, are, are as many grants to, to nonprofits. And so funding was low. And so what they needed to do was to learn how to fundraise. And Bennett started his own company teaching that, teaching it to nonprofits and also working with philanthropists and donors and showing them how they can tell if their money is being used correctly. He also trained nonprofits and administration so that if they did get funding, they would be able to utilize it for their capital needs and their operational needs and so that they could stretch the dollar because, again, funding was so tight at this time. So he had this really good reputation of providing training and education and support, not just to nonprofits, but to people who wanted to give to those nonprofits. It sounds like someone who was so well-educated and well-versed in how nonprofits operate and how they get financial support was really well-positioned to take advantage of that knowledge and education that he had, and not in a good way. Yes. And I guess that's what's so strange about this case, because you have a man here who has a history, a very strong history of good work. I mean, he said that he was building a kingdom, you know, God's kingdom of charity, of giving, of love, of compassion. And you have a history showing that he did do that, that he was doing that. But what I was able to find out during my investigation, and, and, you know, let me give credit to everyone before I forget. This case was so large and the impact that it had, not just in this country, but also in England and and, and other European countries, that we had a team. And it was myself, Loretta Hart, and Brian Cosgriff. Now, Brian Cosgriff was an FBI agent who was a CPA. He handled a lot of the uh, really intricate financial details. Uh, Loretta Hart was in charge of looking at some of the philanthropists and dealing with, uh, with those types of donors. I was in charge, which I thought was the one of the best assignments, of dealing with the donors, not just the nonprofit donors, but the smaller, rich individuals who provided funding. And I, the reason I say that I thought I had the best job is because I really got to speak to people to understand how confused they were that somebody they trusted would do this, how confused they were of why he did it, and of course, the hurt they felt because in many cases which is the case in many Ponzi schemes and and many investment frauds, they convinced their friends, their associates, their colleagues to also participate in this. So it it was really, um, it was really an opportunity to look at a case from a very deep and personal one to one type of um, association. And I really valued that. Jerry, when the bankruptcy settlement went through, were any of these investors repaid? Did they recoup even a percentage of the the funds they had given to to Bennett? Yes, they were able to recoup some of it. Now, I can tell you that there were over 1,100 victims in this case. 
And when I say victims, I'm talking about large institutions that are very famous in Philadelphia, such as the Juvenile Diabetes Foundation, the Franklin Institute, the Free Library of Philadelphia, the Philadelphia Orchestra, the United Way, the Salvation Army, the American Red Cross. All of these huge institutions were involved. But there also were many small Bible colleges and schools and, you know, smaller nonprofits that were also victims in this. And some of them did get some of their money back, but not because we were able to find any of the money. And a Ponzi scheme, because in order to keep it afloat, a lot of the money that is brought in has to be repaid back to investors. So you're, you're not going to have a lot of cash sitting around. What you have really is winners and losers. The, mm. the winners are the people that got in early and were able to double their investment, get those matching funds. And the losers, sorry for the negative term, but the losers are the people who came in at the end who invested but uh, never did get to see a return of their funds. And so the reason that people were able to get some money back is what is called clawback. And that's where the court asked the winners to divest their winnings and provide that to the losers. I've never heard of that before. Yes. So. Wow. And and that happens in, in many, many Ponzi schemes are investment scams where people actually made money during a, a criminal fraud because that's not fair. You know, here's a criminal case and, you know, you are able to, to make money. Basically, you are reaping the benefits of someone else being defrauded. And that's where clawback comes. And I, and I guess I don't know if this is true, but you can tell from the name. Uh, you know, what they decided to call it clawback, that in many cases, <laughs> the winners are really reluctant to give some of that money back, especially when they've already spent it. Can you imagine a nonprofit that was one of the winners who were able to get money from the new era of philanthropy to create maybe a, a, a new church or, you know, some type of a new a dormitory? And now they're being told they have to give the money back. Well, the money's gone. And so the winners, you can understand why they would be upset about having to to return those funds. Well, and in some cases, I think when you're working at a nonprofit, the money is spent before you've even received the donations because you're working so hard through the generous donations of your sponsors and the community that you're already looking to what are the next steps you need to take with the with the foundation or the organization or or whatever it is? Is it supporting children? Is it supporting families? Is it creating more programs, you know, for the city? And so you've already got that money earmarked for so much, I would imagine, as a nonprofit, that whenever those funds come in, to your point, Jerry, they were gone before they even came in because you've had it earmarked for ages. Exactly. That's what was so sad about this. You know, when I went out and spoke to many of those organizations, you know, people were in tears. They were crying. There were people so depressed, so, so distraught because they thought they had done, they were so proud of the fact that they were able to get this funding from New Era. And they were so happy that they were able to give to their clients and to learn that it was, it was a fraud. And that they had to give it back was just devastating, devastating to them. I think it's a testament to how John Bennett represented himself. And, and to your point, he wasn't always a scam artist. But when you have huge organizations like some of the ones you mentioned, the, the Philadelphia Public Library and even the Philadelphia Academy of Natural Sciences, when organizations like those are looking to him as someone who could be a, a very reliable and not necessarily aggressive, but somebody who could really help deliver funding for their organizations and, and their programs, that says a lot about who he is. And I would imagine that his reputation, in addition to just realizing that everything was a scam, these folks must have felt so violated as a result of this. Oh, absolutely. Now, we have to remember that, you know, when somebody commits a fraud, and, and I've dealt with all of my years working, you know, fraud cases and, and corruption cases, when somebody commits a fraud, 
They do it for a variety of reasons. The first one, of course, is money. But the second one is power. And in his case, and I'm not saying he didn't make any money. We'll talk about that in a minute. But in his case, I think he got off on the power trip because we had these huge organizations. We had rich philanthropists that were coming to him begging to be allowed to participate in the Foundation for New Era Philanthropy. They called it a new concept of participatory philanthropy, which meant that instead of somebody just giving you money, that you were participating in it. And the participation was that you would take your money, like so you had a a, a drug rehab center. They had to first raise it started off like $50,000. So they would have to first right. raise $50,000 on their own. And then they would participate in the philanthropy by giving it to Bennett for six months so that they could prove that it was not operational money, but capital money that they had, that they had uh, earned through donations. They would give it to him for six months. And then six months later, he would return to them $100,000. And so they were participating in this donation. That's how it started. But through my investigation, my part of the investigation, I found out how it really started. What was that? Well, Bennett had all of these businesses. He had the fundraising business and the training business. And just like I said before, they weren't doing too well. He expanded too quickly. He had grants from rich individuals. He had grants from the federal government, but he was a bad businessman and he just wasn't, he wasn't stealing the funds. He wasn't, as far as, you know, we could tell, he wasn't doing anything wrong with the funds. He just didn't know how to manage the money and the businesses started failing. And just like I said before, you know, that's how a Ponzi scheme usually starts. And we could see that his bank accounts were so overdrawn, were so insufficient that he started a check kite. Now, a check kite is where you take advantage of the float between the time period when you deposit a check and it clears. It works a lot faster now because everything's okay, online. Yes. But when you, used to, yes. yeah, when you used to put a check in the bank, it might take two or three days for it to clear. During that time, your bank would allow you to use those funds. Now, people check kite all the time. Uh, usually they might do it because, hey, look, I'm going to get paid on Friday, but this bill needs to be paid on Tuesday. So I'm going to pay the bill on Tuesday. By the time the check clears, my paycheck should be in. That, right. And I'll have the funds to cover. It. Right. That's, that's still illegal because when you wrote the check, you had insufficient funds, but it happens. But what he would do is he didn't have any funds coming in. He would just keep manipulating checks and putting this check in this bank account and that check in that bank account and take advantage of that float. But sooner or later, the bank caught on to it and they demanded their money. Now what is he going to do? And he comes up to some of his rich donors that he's been dealing with, that he's been working with, and he tells them about this new matching program involving anonymous donors, people who are super, super rich, but super, super busy and just don't have the time to devote to figuring out the, the the right people who deserve their money. And he tells these other donors that the anonymous donors have hired him to do the work for them. And he convinces initially three or four people to give him $5,000 that, that they're going to make out to their favorite charity and that he's going to get the anonymous donors to match the funds. And, you know, at $5,000, these donors who had known him for a long, long time thought, you know, that's not much to risk. You know, I'm, I'm rich anyway. $5,000. Yeah. $5,000. You know, that's like $5. No, I would imagine it seemed like a very safe investment right. to some of the folks that went on in the early days of, of the foundation. So they do it. And lo and behold, uh, he does pay them back $10,000 because he does end up getting a loan or a grant. Uh, I'm not sure where it came from, but he was able to get a grant. And by the time this matching program was over, 
that Gran had come in and he was able to pay them back. Well, I'm sure he's thinking, good, now I'm whole again, everything's great. But they loved it so much, they wanted to do it again, and they wanted their friends to be able to take advantage of it again. And what, what is he going to say? The anonymous donor said it was a one-time deal. It's over. They, they, they don't want to <laughs> no, do it anymore. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense at all. Right. So unfortunately for him, that the people who fell for his scam wanted to do it again. You know, they had other charities. They wanted to give more. And again, as I mentioned, that once you start in a Ponzi scheme, you've got to get more and more and more people to invest in order to keep it afloat. And so it went from a $5,000 match to the anonymous donors, you know, think it's too many people trying to take advantage of it. So we're only going to allow people who have $50,000 to participate. And then it got to a point where only people who had $500,000 could participate. It did two things. It stopped all these little nickel and dime people from trying to be a part of it but it also gave him more and more money because remember, he's got all these other initial investors, the original investors he has to pay back to. And so it kept growing and growing and growing and growing. And during this time, he just, I don't know what happened to him, but he just, well, you know what? He was later diagnosed as a narcissist. So he really got off on this power trip. He really got off on people thinking he was so great. He was so wonderful. And he just, you know, it was like Bernie Madoff. Bernie Madoff. Sure. Yeah, it's it's really that same type of personality. I mean, I couldn't live with myself knowing that I was scamming people. You know, it would be hard for me to sleep. It'd be hard for me to breathe. But he was traveling around the world, traveling around the country, you know, giving these speeches, talking about philanthropy and kingdom building and God's work. And people believed him. And it just grew and grew and grew. Well, and, you know, I, I think about, and obviously not to get into religion, but when he talks about doing God's work, I would imagine that if he had a chance to speak to the Heavenly Father, he probably would have said, John, this is not my work. Oh. This is not <laughs> This is not what I want you to do, buddy. So from what I read, Jerry, he took in, through the foundation, over $350 million. Yes. In that six-year period that he ran this pseudo-matching donor scheme. Yes. Isn't that amazing? 300 and I think it was $354 million he took in. Now, again, I talked about how, you know, some of that money was given to winners who had to give it back. So by the end, the loss ended up being about $135 million. Which is still an enormous amount of money, but to be able to shrink it from over $350 million, I mean, that was an enormous effort to to get it down to that level, I would imagine. Absolutely. And I think that the court did a, a wonderful job of convincing, or should I say, ordering, you know, the uh, the participants to, to return the fund. So if you initially put in $500,000, and you kept matching that over and over again, and now you've gotten $2 million, well, you've got to give back that 1.5 million and you're only left you're only allowed to keep your initial 500,000 that you had and and so uh that's how they were able to make some people whole in a sense and others at least get part of their initial investment back but this still gets even more twisted when it comes to the final stages of the investigation we assumed that with all of the financial information, because again, Brian, the agent with the CPA is doing all of the later financial dealings. He's the one, you know, who came up with the, uh, along with the bankruptcy court and the SEC with the $354 million scam and dwindled it down to $135,000 loss. So he's doing that type of work. And of course, I was able to look at his initial personal accounts and find, you know, how the fraud started. So I've scheduled out all of those checks. So you would think, Mm. you would think we've got enough evidence. We have enough evidence that when we say, you know, we're charging you an 82 count indictment. Oh my goodness. 82 counts. He was uh, charged with wire fraud, bank fraud, money laundering, impeding the administration of revenue laws, 
money. Uh, did I say money laundering? False statements. Uh, <laughs> I think we could say money laundering a few <laughs> yes, times, yes, considering how yes. much money went through his hands. So you would think at this point, when you're when you're hit with an 82 count indictment, that you're just going to roll over and say, "Okay, you got me." But when it came time, he refused to plead guilty. He pleaded no contest. Now, what's the difference between no contest and not guilty? There, there is, a, there's distinctions there. And for folks, you know, who may be listening outside of the U.S. who have very different types of pleas, how would you differentiate between no contest versus not guilty? When you enter a no contest plea, you are not admitting guilt. What you're basically saying is, look, I know that the government appears to have enough evidence that they're going to charge, that they're going to charge me. They have enough evidence that I probably will be convicted. I'm not saying I'm guilty, but I'm not going to contest this conviction. And so, you know, here's a man, a man of God, you know, a man who says that he's a born again Christian. But when it comes to the fraud where he's caught red handed, he can't even accept responsibility for that. And I don't know. I mean, he, some people will say it's because he was so into the love of God and humanity that it hurt his heart to be able to admit that he had done wrong. I'm not sure if that's the case, but it would be nice to think that John Bennett was, you know, just such a, a loving human being who really was coming at this from a good place and with the best of intentions for the donors and companies on which he was working. I don't think it's all that altruistic because considering how he started, you know, everything you shared, Jerry, about the businesses he had before he launched the foundation and the struggles that he had with those businesses because of his own mismanagement, this wasn't something that started before he found himself in a tough financial position. It definitely looks like he started this to get himself out of that position and then it was like a ball, a snowball running downhill, just gathering more snow and growing and growing as it rolls until it eventually rolled over him. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And let's not forget that out of this money, he did take $8 million. Some of that money was used to try to uphold or to keep going some of those other failing businesses. So he took money from what he got from New Era and the matching program, and he tried to put it into other businesses. But he also had a Lexus, his, bought his daughter a car, he bought a new home, he bought his daughter a new home. He traveled to Africa, England, Asia, he traveled all over the world. So some of that $8 million, you know, he definitely took advantage of it personally. Yeah, he was living the life of Riley. Oh, yeah. With other people's money. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> it's not like he bought his daughter a Taurus. I mean, he's out there <laughs> buying a Lexus. <laughs> That's true. And there were also real misrepresentations that we were able to find that he made to people. Well, first of all, he said he had these anonymous donors. I don't think I would surprise you or anyone listening that there were no anonymous donors. That These people did not exist. He also told everyone that he had trust agreements, that any money that they gave him was put into a semi-escrow uh, account and that it would be safe. And the truth is, when you look at his bank records, as soon as the money went in, the money went out. Mm -hmm. uh, he also said that he wasn't paid, that he did this out of the goodness of his heart. And again, I told you, he, he, he took $8 million on his uh, non-paid position. Wow, I would love to be unpaid $8 million. <laughs> and he also gave them a list. Not only were there no anonymous donors, but the foundation, he had told people that they had a board of directors that were, you know, helping him make decisions and setting up rules. And of course, there was no board of director. Everything was run by him and through him. Now, he had lots of employees very bright-eyed people that really believed in the program, who really believed that he was doing God's work. They had no idea that it was all a fraud because he directed everything. He had an accountant who kind of looked the other way, you know, who didn't do the proper audits. He got charged too. He got charged because we were able to show that he took $51,000 and we believe that it was because, you know, he was looking the other way. Mm. 
But the, the best thing about this case, which really makes it twisted, is that when it comes time for him to plead no contest, one of the reasons he said he couldn't plead guilty is because he really believed that the anonymous donors existed. His defense was that he was delusional and that when he said he met with the anonymous donors, he meant it. He truly believed that he held meetings with them, that he saw them, that he knew them, that he was having psychotic episodes because he truly believed they existed. I wonder if that's a case of someone who lies for so very long and so extensively that they just start believing their own lies, that that perception then becomes their reality. That could be the case. You know, I'm a little bit more skeptical. I just think he's a big fat. I think he's a big fat liar. Because <laughs> you got to remember when, when a fraud, the basic definition of a fraud is when you obtain something of value, whether it's money or property based on a lie or deception or just a lack of providing information that would allow someone to know that you're lying. And, you know, so. I, I guess for him to be able to plea no contest and the fact that we were able to show that these anonymous donors did not exist, how is he going to get out of that without saying, yeah, I'm a big fat liar? The only way he could, right. he could get out of it was saying, oh, but I thought they were. I thought they did exist. And that's how he went down. He <laughs> actually went down continuing to say that he was delusional and he truly believed that the anonymous donors existed. Now, how twisted is that? That's seriously twisted. I, I, I tend to think you're on to something when you say he's just a big fat liar and it really isn't any sort of psychosis that he was experiencing. You talk about him going down. So I read that he could have been sentenced to up to 27 years, but he got much less time than that. Yes. He was only sentenced to about 12 years. Yes, he got tw a 12 year sentence which is still significant in white collar crime. But, okay. but yes, he, he could have, and the government certainly wanted him to be sentenced to 20 to, to 30 years. But the judge looked at his history of good work. I mean, you still had people who, although they could see that this was a fraud, was a Ponzi scheme, but they still believed in him. He received massive amounts of positive letters were sent to the court for his sentencing, uh, to people speaking on his behalf, asking for the judge to be lenient. And uh, the judge looked at those letters, looked at his history, and uh, gave him 12 years. I don't know where he is. I don't know, uh, you know, what he's doing now. I hate to say this because it makes me sound like, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm gullible too. But I would imagine that during that time period in jail, if he initially had good intentions and a good heart, that he's probably doing something to make amends, you know, working someplace to help others. I kind of believe that. I, I, I don't know if he's, if this is, uh, the typical fraudster that I usually have met where once they get out of jail, they start another fraud. I think it may be in mm -hmm. this particular case. He, he may be doing something in a, a mission in, in Costa Rica or something. I don't know where he, where he is trying to keep a low profile and, uh, and, and make amends for, for what he did. I think, I think we would all hope for that. I don't think that makes you naive. I think that's just the nature of the human condition, right? We, we hope that folks who do bad things will come to a place where they can understand what they did and really take accountability for it and, and consider how they might be able to make restitution. And even if it isn't directly to the people that they they hurt or schemed, there's other ways that they could do that through changes that they make in their life. And as you said, perhaps, you know, doing some other sort of philanthropic work that doesn't involve money. Yes. No money yeah, no, at all. No money. Don't give them any money. <laughs> yeah, that that is the case. Now, again, I have had many subjects in cases that I've worked that I don't see that type of prediction. I see them not knowing anything else to do in their life or any other way of getting by in life, but by lying and stealing and cheating. But uh, there are many people that I can see 
learning the the right way to do things and wanting to do it the right way. And I, I've seen that in several situations, and I would hope that that was the case with John Bennett. Is there a high rate of recidivism among white collar criminals, the types of crimes that we just talked about with John Bennett? You know what? I don't know. And, you know, the the definition of, of white collar crime, for those who aren't quite sure, it's any type of criminal activity that involves business. You know, so usually it's a transaction. And I think what makes it difficult sometimes to to investigate is, you know, is this just a bad deal? You know, is this a civil matter? Are, you know, are we able to prove that this particular business transaction was a crime? That the, one of the people, one of the parties in this business transaction were never able to come through with whatever promises or agreements that were agreed to. Uh, so, you know, it's a, there are difficult cases. I would think that if somebody always continues to end up in some type of a questionable business deal, then yeah, the recidivism rate for that particular person is pretty high. Uh, but uh, I, I would hope that in most cases of white collar crime, the fact that that person who considered themselves an upstanding business person is now tried and convicted and has been sent away for jail, their reputation is ruined, their businesses are ruined, that once they get out doing something bad again or criminal again that could possibly make them end up back in jail is not something that they want to see happen. Cherry, what do you think it is about this city that makes it a breeding ground for corruption and financial schemes? I mean, you've spent you spent 24, I believe, out of your 26 years as a special agent with the FBI here in Philadelphia and working in corruption, you had to be pretty busy. Yeah, absolutely. Now, there are two types of, there's two squads in Philadelphia. There's the public corruption, which has to deal with uh, officials, you know, government officials who, uh, are, who are doing the same type of frauds. It's the same type of fraud. It's the same type of corruption. I did it on the corporate side, on the individual side. And we had a whole squad of, of, of agents who did it on the, on the official side. And the reason that there's a difference is because there are certain rules and regulations that you have to follow. It's a little bit tighter control on what you're charging people and, and the investigation. Again, because you've got to make sure there's no partisan or political mm -hmm. leanings towards those investigations. And I know you know what I'm talking about because of the uh, accusations. I call them false accusations that are out there now about the FBI. But when it comes to looking at public corruption, you have a lot more people and eyes on, you know, what you're investigating and the different investigative methods that you use. But definitely in this city of Philadelphia, we have had some unbelievable cases on the corporate side and on the public side when it comes to corruption. Just last year, for those who aren't from the Philadelphia area, not only did we have a federal congressman, a sitting representative, yes, uh, yes con <laughs> convicted of corruption and fraud, but we also had our district attorney, the head law enforcement official for the city of Philadelphia was also convicted of corruption and fraud, both in the same year, time year period, which is... That was horrible. Horrible. Oh. You couldn't, you couldn't put on a Philly news station or pick up any one of our many papers without seeing one or both on the cover or the headline story on the news. It was just, it was everywhere. Yeah. It, it wasn't a good look for Philly. <laughs> no, it was not. Well, so, you know, we're talking a little bit about the types of cases that you really focused on. Would you take us a little bit through your journey? I know you, you talk to your guests about that, and I would imagine your listeners, just like me, would love to hear what was the journey that led you to the FBI? Yeah, you know what? That's kind of fresh. I, I really don't think I've talked a lot about that. But I was a juvenile probation officer. I was a psychology major in college. And when I got out of college, I was looking for a job in the psychology counseling area. And as most people who have psychology majors know, you know, you really need a master's degree or a PhD to, to continue 
into the, the counseling field, but I was able to find a job as a juvenile probation officer. The title really was aftercare counselor. So I really did learn some therapies uh, and counseling areas that I could use because my clients had gone away to reform school. So I traveled to the reform school to meet with them, and then I helped them get back into the community. And so I did actually do counseling with them and their parents. The funny thing is, you know, I was 23, 24, 25 years old when I was doing this job. And I actually had parents asking me how to raise their kids, you know, make her change her clothes, you know, make him, uh. make him come in on time. And yeah, I, I could, I look back at that now and I'm like, why did they hire me? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was a kid myself having all this responsibility of, you know, traveling around the state of Virginia, Department of Correction, meeting with these kids that were away in reform school. And then when they coming, when they're coming back, trying to get them back into school, trying to get them jobs. But I loved that job. I really... It must have been so rewarding. It really was. And I had kids that were selling drugs. I had young girls that were prostitutes. I had people that were breaking into houses. You know, these were serious crimes again, because these were kids that uh, had been adjudicated and sent away. So these were serious crimes. Unfortunately, two of the kids that I had on my caseload after I left and joined the FBI, actually were convicted of murder. Uh, so they had come across a woman whose car was broken down on the highway, a pregnant woman, and uh, they ended up uh, trying to steal her car. And during the, during the whole thing, she, uh, they killed her. So uh, these were, oh my God, these were criminals, but they were also kids. So I enjoyed you know, there, yeah. th th that part of it too. But I was really too young for that job. And, and I knew it. I knew that I was going to, that I was burning out even after only doing it for a little more than three years. I was burning out because I gave everything, everything to those kids. And so one day I'm looking at this newsletter and it said that the FBI was looking for women and minorities. They were having a big, huge diversity push because even today, the FBI has a difficult time in bringing diversity to its ranks. You know, if I was in the FBI right now, I would be among less than 1% of the agents. Black females make less than 1% of the FBI special agent ranks. And that was what was going on back then, too. So I see this newsletter saying that the FBI is looking for women and minorities. Never thought about joining the FBI. In my mind, FBI agents were basically white males, and why would they want yep. me? <laughs> Fifty-year-old white guys in a bed suit. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> that that that's the image. And I think the reason I was open to the possibility is that my roommate and my best friend in college had graduated from college and joined the Baltimore Police Department. So I was open to the idea of law enforcement. I called and the agent who answered the phone, Randy Waldrop, I remember his name now, was absolutely wonderful. He spoke with me on the phone for almost an hour. I still have the notes that I took that day. Do you really? I still have the notes oh, that I took that day. That's exceptional. And I talked to him. He really, and the thing is, you know, if, if, if I were a hiring manager and somebody called me, and had no idea what the job was about, I probably would be very, very negative towards them. Look, you know, call me back. Wouldn't be an hour. Yeah. yeah, wouldn't be an hour phone call. No, no. But he really took the time to to sell me. He sold the FBI. He recruited me. And by the time I got off the phone, I was going to apply to the FBI. And uh, next thing I know, I'm walking into the FBI Academy. I had 16 weeks of training. Uh, we know we do academics, you know, especially on legal matters, learning what the FBI can and can't do. Firearms, you know, learning the, at the time it was a revolver, the shotgun and uh, the, the rifle and physical fitness, you know, push-ups, pull-ups, sit-ups. I kind of call the FBI Academy a combination of basic training and graduate school. It sounds like it. Yeah. And, and, and it really was. And, and, uh, you know, I did, very well in the, in the academy, uh, did very well academically, did very well as far as firearms and did exceptionally well as, as far as physical fitness. Cause luckily I was already fit in the probation office that I worked in. There were a lot of runners and I actually was training for 
the Marine Corps Marathon, 26.2 miles, when I got my appointment to the academy. And I was, wow. and I was there during that time period. So since I had been training for the marathon, I actually did the Marine Corps Marathon while I was going through the FBI Academy. Oh my goodness. Yeah, not a good idea. I did finish it, <laughs> but it wasn't a good idea because the next day, you know, when everybody else was still doing, you know, doing their physical fitness and their firearms training, I really wanted to be, you know, curled up in a, in a ball in bed because I was so sore, but I still had to continue with those duties. So I don't recommend <laughs> doing that, but, uh, <laughs> um, so that was the Academy. And, uh, at the time I was living in Virginia, my father's in the Air Force and he retired after 20 some years at Langley Air Force Base. And so we were living in Hampton, Virginia. I went back to Virginia for six months in the Norfolk Division where I worked bank robberies for a period of time. And then I got transferred to about as far away as you can get, Sacramento, California. I thought you were in California for about a year or so. I, I remember you mentioning that in, in an episode that you did with Gangland. Yes. Yeah. So I, when you joined, when you joined their show. Yeah. So I was only there for a year and a half, which didn't make a lot of sense. And then they uh, transferred me again. They asked sometimes, you know, for a list of where you would like to be transferred, which is really a joke because for the needs of the Bureau is what you hear all the time. And so. The fact that I wanted to get back on the East Coast and that it happened was just a coincidence. I don't think they were trying to meet my needs, but I was, <laughs> I actually wanted to come to Philadelphia. I had never really lived here, but I had been in Philadelphia. I, I went to school at Morgan State in Baltimore. So I had been to Philadelphia and I thought, well, this will be a, a nice large office. I wanted to go to a large office so I wouldn't have to be transferred again. And uh, luckily I got Philadelphia. I will say that again, it was just a coincidence because the date of the letter that I sent to the transfer unit listing the offices I'd like to be transferred to is the same date of my transfer letter. So they had no idea they were giving me. So they hadn't received your letter. It was just divine providence that you wound up in the city that would have been your first choice. Absolutely. And I'm sure when, I'm sure when they got the letter, they wanted to rescind the transfer. Oh no, we, we actually gave somebody something they wanted. Stop, stop. I don't know. But um, so I ended up in Philadelphia. Now, I'm going to be honest and, and, and let people know, and I don't talk about this a lot, but during my first four years with the FBI, it didn't go as well as I thought it would be. I mean, this was a time period, even though women had been in the FBI for 10 years, there still wasn't a lot of women in the FBI. And there certainly weren't a lot of minority women. And I don't know if initially people knew what to do with me. And I would say for my first four years in the FBI, I kind of floundered a bit. Um, I don't, I take some responsibility for that because, you know, I did, I didn't, I didn't know what I was doing. I was 25 years old and the average agent who's hired is 30. So I was on the, on the young side and I kept being transferred six months in Norfolk, a year and a half in Sacramento. Then I get to Philly. And I just didn't feel like I was hitting the ground running, that I, I looked around me and there were people my, who had been in the same time period that I was in who were making cases and making arrests. And I guess I kind of doubted myself. And then some of the reaction that I was getting, you know, from supervisors uh, and management, there was a time period around four years in that I really thought about quitting. I, I just, I had always been a, an achiever had always been someone who excelled, you know, as far as academics and you know everything that I did, you know, I, I really mean it. Everything that I did, I did it with gusto and I put my whole heart into it and I was always successful. And I, those first four years, I just didn't feel successful. I, I, I kept feeling that people were disrespecting me. I felt that they were things were being said or, or done, you know, I, I just didn't feel valued. And I considered quitting. It was at the same time period that my classmate, Jerry Dove, was killed in the Miami shootout in 1986. And I think that jolted me. You know, it really, I, I don't know why it did, but it really gave me a commitment to 
stay in the FBI and make it work. I, I really appreciate your candor. Thank you for sharing that. And, and I want to first say I'm I'm sorry about what happened with your friend in Miami, I, especially as a young person in a new career. That must have been such a shock. And, and I appreciate you sharing all this because I, I really wanted to ask you, you know, and when I listened to one of your earlier episodes when you interviewed Agent Judy Taylor and you had shared some recent statistics about women in the Bureau that I think it was out of close to 14,000 agents just under 20% are women. And you'd mentioned earlier in our conversation that less than 1% are minority women. And so I had questions that I wanted to ask you about your experience as a woman in the Bureau, not just female, but as an African-American woman when there probably were very, very few, if even today there's less than 1%. Yeah, I, I wanted to be honest, you know, about the initial years because it was the truth. And I can tell you, you know, things that were said to me and, and ways that I was treated initially, uh, and not by the institution, but by individual individuals. And when I complained about them, I, I was not given the type of response that I thought was appropriate. And I, again, I don't want to get into <laughs> that too much, but let me tell you what happened. I found that my classmate, Jerry Dove is, is killed in this horrific, you know, shootout in Miami. And even though it had been three and a half years since we went through the academy together, when I was in Sacramento and he was in San, and, and San Diego, I had gone to San Diego with my sister. We had met for drinks. When he was in Miami, I had talked to him a number of times. We were just good friends. We were the Jerry's in the class. And so it's not just like it was a classmate. It was somebody I really cared about. You know, when he died, I, I went to West Virginia. I went to that funeral because I wanted to, to be there uh, for him. And I wanted to be there for his, his mother, you know, who he, he talked about a lot. So, you know, this was important to me. But I also was having all of these issues, too. And what happened was I ended up on the applicant squad. And for the agents that are listening, that can tell you how bad things got. Because a lot of times, people who ended up on the applicant squad, which is uh, the agents who used to do the background investigations, for people applying for the FBI. That was usually given to people who were not seen as bright stars. You know, so you know they had to do the background investigation. I ended up there and I was just devastated. Again, I had always been this this overachiever. You know, I had always done well in everything that I did. And and so that's that's why I was thinking, you know, I should just quit because now I'm sitting now I'm on the applicant squad. At the time we had an African-American special agent in charge. He was in charge of the entire office. His name was Wayne Davis. And Wayne Davis came to me and he said, look, the FBI is continuing to put a push out for women and minorities. And I'm looking at you and I think that you can help out a lot. And he named me as the hiring manager for the Philadelphia office. Now, I only have four years in. There are agents, <laughs> yeah, there are agents in the office who have 20 years in. And at first I looked at it as what had been happening to me all along, which is making me feel like a token that I'm being used because I'm a, a minority female. There were so many instances I felt like I wasn't getting ahead in my career because I was put in places or given assignments because I was a minority female. And I thought, well, here we go again. But Wayne Davis said, no, this is an important job and I want you to do it. So even though I had only four years in, I became what's called the applicant coordinator or the hiring manager. And I did that for three years. And the funny thing about it is that during those three years of recruiting other people into the FBI, and it was women, it was minorities, but it was also a very diverse group of, of white males that I talked to and and, and taught them about the FBI and convinced them and recruited. I was, I was recruiting everybody who was interested in the FBI. And during that time period, guess who I recruited? Did you recruit Jim? I, well, I, I did. <laughs> Jim Fitzgerald. Are you talking about Jim Fitzgerald? But <laughs> yes, I am talking about Jim Fitzgerald. Yeah, yeah, he was, he, he was one of my recruits, but no, I, I recruited me. You recruited yourself. I recruited myself because remember I was at a very low period. Oh, that's the best story ever. That's like a stay interview. That's fantastic. Yes, I recruited myself <laughs> by going out around, you know, the, the Philadelphia, Pennsylvania area and talking to groups and interviewing uh, potential candidates and helping them go through the application process and dealing with headquarters and telling them stories about the FBI and 
why they should want to join and what's going to happen to them. I fell back in love with the FBI. And so after three years of doing that, I went to the SAC at the time. It wasn't Wayne Davis anymore. And I said, I'm ready. I'm ready to get back into investigations. And Dina, once I got back into investigations, I kicked ass. Yes, you did. (laughs) I can hear it in your voice. Well, and obviously with the incredible career that you had, that is such a great story. And I think it's so important for people, men and women, to hear that because all of us at one point in our lives, for one reason or another, have, have been in a place in our career where maybe we've we felt disconnected or adrift and, and not really sure what that next step should be. And, you know, a big part of that is taking accountability, taking personal accountability yes. and recognizing what you can control and what is outside of your scope of control. And, you know, I can't imagine how difficult it must have been for you when you were, you know, so young, just starting out in the in the bureau and and feeling probably very much alone sometimes. But it's just such a great story of self-empowerment and accountability. And, you know, by selling the bureau to others, you resold it to yourself. That's just, thank you so much for sharing yeah, that. I, and, and that's the truth. I do want to give people an idea because I don't want them to, to in their mind, trying to figure out what kind of things I'm talking about when I, when I talked about uh, things that happened to me. It was little subtle things. I just wanted to make sure people knew that it wasn't, you know, nobody was doing anything, you know, outwardly racist or sexist. It was just little things that just had broken me down. But let me be very clear that once I had recruited myself, once I knew why I was there, once I knew my value to the FBI, nothing like that ever happened again. I wouldn't let it. People wouldn't even try it. (laughs) <laughs> and the rest of my career was fantastic. It was absolutely, I got along well with everyone in the office. I had unbelievable cases and successes. And well, you know how it all ended. So it, it ended in the totally different direction of going from somebody who wasn't sure about whether they belonged in the FBI and wanted to quit. And at the end, I ended up being the representative for the Philadelphia office, the spokesperson for the Philadelphia office when it came to the media and any public outward facing. It's it's just remarkable when I look back on my career. Well, and you also were the recipient of three United States Attorney Awards for Distinguished Service. That's correct. Was one of them for the case that we talked about? Yes. Yes. So I got an award for working that case. I also had an advanced fee case where the bad guy ended up getting a 14-year conviction, a 14-year sentence. And uh, I had a business-to-business telemarketing fraud that had multiple subjects with multiple jail time and and convictions. So, And I I received a U.S. Attorney's Award for that one, too. So, yeah, I I, I feel like I had a very well-rounded career, not only working major investigative uh, cases, but also as the program manager for applicants and as the media coordinator or spokesperson at the end of my career. You really became in that role, I would call it like the face for the Philadelphia division of the FBI. Yes. So I would go on camera locally and nationally uh, to talk about the FBI, to to kind of set the the public's perception of the FBI, to kind of mold that. Uh, Of course, when uh, there are matters that the special agent in charge or different agents or program managers or ASACs were better suited for, then I would work with the media to set those up. But when it was just a day-to-day discussion about maybe a, an arrest that we did or a sentencing, then I uh, I, I handled those uh, media inquiries. Now, you retired from the FBI about eight or nine years ago? Yeah, 2008, I retired. Okay. When I listened to the very first episode of FBI Retired Case File Review, you referenced your inner Oprah. (laughs) And although at the time you were a full-time published author after retiring from the Bureau, you mentioned how that media public relations bug was still in your blood. I think the days, obviously, being the spokesperson for the city of Philadelphia's Bureau of the FBI definitely stuck with you. And that's, I'm guessing, what brought you to the podcast world. Yes. 
Now, in between that, when I retired in 2008, I took a job with SEPTA. And as you know, SEPTA is the transportation, the public transportation provider for the city of Philadelphia, the trains, the buses, the trolleys, the subways. And I did that for seven years. It was the second most favorite job I've ever had. Some great, great people. And I was their, I was their director of media relations or their spokesperson. But that job was killing me. <laughs> it was 24 <laughs> seven. I loved it, but boy, that was a hard, difficult job. Things were always happening. So after seven years, I have all these creative juices that were flowing. And I decided that, uh, you know, the, the book that I had been writing, it was time for me to, to, to move that forward. And I also enjoyed talking and being in the media and being a spokesperson. So I, hired myself to be a uh, a lay a lay person spokesperson for the FBI with my podcast FBI retired case file review how do you line up such fantastic guests are you pulling on obviously your relationships with former colleagues and they all seem very excited and willing to talk and share their stories i think that the most difficult part of my podcasting career is getting people to do the podcast. Yes, I, I depend a lot on people that I know and those relationships at the very beginning, but now I'm reaching out to agents all over the country. I see them on LinkedIn. Uh, we have a, uh, an organization, the Society of Former Special Agents of the FBI, and they have a monthly magazine called The Grapevine. And I go through the grapevine and I look at great cases and agents that are being highlighted and I call them. And this is a lot of work. You know, I know that when you have been retired and you worked a case 10 years ago, five years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and, you know, someone asked you to, to, to come on and, and talk, you know, in depth about a, you know, a case review. It's a lot of work. And some agents say, yeah, I'll do it. And then I never hear from them again. And some agents, uh, you know, say, no, you know, I, that's behind me. Uh, I don't remember anything. I didn't keep any papers. And so I am absolutely honored and grateful and thrilled that I've had so many agents at, uh, you know, more than 120 uh, by the time of this, uh, who have said yes and have come on and have, you know, shared their personal stories, not just the case reviews, but they talk about, you know, what happened with their home life and, and how they felt about different cases. I'm, I'm just the luckiest podcaster in the world. <laughs> I think we're all so lucky because we get to listen to all of it because they're, they're fascinating. And for me as a listener, your show really humanizes an agency that has, I guess, just growing up thinking about the FBI and watching the FBI and movies and television. It had mystery and just it felt somewhat cloak and dagger and, oh, somebody's an FBI agent. And listening to your show, besides the unbelievable, compelling stories that you and your fellow agents have to share, it's just really humanized folks and helped me see them as, you know, they're not just special agents. They've got families they've got to come home to. They have husbands or wives or partners or children and grandchildren that are worried about them and maybe there's some things they can or can't talk about. And I think it's just, it's just really put a very personal spin on something that to me always seemed a bit distant and mysterious. And I agree. And, and that's one of the things that I, I think the reason that I try to pull that type of information out of the agent, because, you know, I did do uh, the, the role of, of the media coordinator of the spokesperson for five years and the bureau for whatever reason, does not showcase the agent. They showcase when they do talk about cases, and I think they do a good job of, of presenting cases. They just give a very cold and, and distant look at the investigation. And I know there's so many great stories that people would enjoy hearing, but the Bureau doesn't try to, they don't highlight the agents. Matter of fact, if you hear about a major case and there's a press conference, you'll never see the case agent standing behind the SAC and the United States attorney or even the, the assistants who tried the case. The case agent who may have spent years working on that case is not up there on the podium. He or she may not even be in the conference room. And 
I, I think for people to really understand who the FBI is, they need to see it on a personal level. So again, the timing of my podcast was just luck. I mean, I started this in January of 2016. And as we all know, in the fall of 2016, the FBI was pulled into the political spotlight. I'm heartbroken that that happened. I I don't talk politics on my podcast, but I do not believe that there is a conspiracy that there ever was. I believe in Christopher Wray, who I heard speak, and I think the FBI is in good hands. And I believe in Robert Mueller, who used to be the director. I I believe that they're in it for the right reasons and that they're going to follow investigations to the logical conclusion, uh, no matter what the result. And until I hear otherwise, all this speculation and rumors and criticisms and innuendos, I'm a law enforcement agent. And so just the facts, ma'am, just give me the facts. (laughs) You know, you have there's segments on your show where you will sometimes share your thoughts about law enforcement in entertainment. So TV series or movies And I'm curious how you feel the Bureau is represented in entertainment. And are there any TV series or films that you think demonstrates a a more authentic representation of what it's like to work for the FBI? My favorite show that's been out in recent times is Mindhunter. Uh, Oh, it's so good. (laughs) And the reason it's so good is because you really get to know the agents that were involved and and you see the the struggles that they have personally and how much they give, how much they give to the job, you know, how important it is for them to get it right. The the relationships, I love the relationships with management because management relationships with the FBI sometimes can be <laughs> difficult. And, uh, <laughs> and I just thought that that show is an excellent representation of how the FBI works and and what it's like to be an FBI agent. It's it's a fantastic show. You know, you've mentioned through talking about Mindhunter and and some of the folks that have been on on your show that what makes a big difference is when you see representation of, of agents as people and getting to understand a little bit about their lives, you know, outside of the Bureau or while they juggle their responsibilities as special agents. You are a wife and a mother And I think about what I've had to juggle for the last 17 years working in corporate America, and I don't think that could possibly compare with what you had to juggle, you know, being a mom who worked outside of the home. How did you balance your role as a special agent with family and kids and school events and all of that? I married right. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'm divorced, so I did. (laughs) No matter whether you're a male or a female agent, you, you have to have support. Because there, are, you could be leaving work and your supervisor calls and says, "Hey, look, uh, you know the the drug squad needs extra agents on an arrest tomorrow. I, you know, I need you to be in Camden at four a.m." And there's no like, "Oh, well, I got to work out my childcare." Oh no, don't even mention that. <laughs> they could care less about your childcare. You just need to be there at four o'clock, and so you have to have support in order to be able to get the job done. There's weekends. Uh, sometimes there's, you know, overseas trips. I was lucky. My, my husband was a high school teacher. And so he was able to get home to get the kids, you know, off the bus and uh, to get them where they needed to be. He was the one that cooked the dinner. And, you know, I'm just was extremely, extremely lucky to have that type of support, which allowed me to do the job that I love. That's terrific. Jerry, is there anything that you might like to share with your listeners that you don't get a chance to in your regular episodes that perhaps I haven't asked you or something that they may not know about you that you'd like to reveal? The main thing that I want to make sure everyone knows is that trust the FBI. The FBI is an institution of people that are dedicated to upholding the Constitution and the laws of this country. There, of course, have always been throughout the history of the FBI individuals uh, such as a a Robert Hansen who have committed criminal acts and have done wrong. But we seek those people out and we make sure that they answer to their digression. So I I just want you to to hold on, to to wait, to wait for the facts and and not listen to the, the speculation out there. 
The second part of that is I want people who are interested in joining the FBI to really consider it. I mean, it's a fantastic job. The FBI investigates over 200 violations of criminal law. And you get to do so many wonderful things and you get to meet so many wonderful people. Although my specialty was economic crime and fraud, you know, I still worked drug cases in Camden because I was in the Camden resident agency for a number of years. I still was able to go out on foreign counterintelligence surveillances in San Francisco and Yosemite Park. Uh, when I was out in Sacramento, I've traveled all over the country interviewing some amazing people. It's just a fantastic job, but only come, only apply if you want to dedicate your life to protecting this country and the citizens. Jerry, I, on behalf of your listeners, would like to thank you for your service to this country as a special agent and for what you do now with your podcast to really give other agents a voice and and help connect those of us, you know, in the civilian world with something that we might not understand. And uh, and I think it gives us a, a much better perspective on the work that you and, and so many other people have done. I am just so grateful to have had this opportunity to talk to you and ask you about your career and your cases for your show. So thank you very much. Thank you. And that's the end of the interview. Before I say anything else, I must give a shout out to the assistant United States attorneys who worked on the new era philanthropy case. So here's a big special shout out to AUSA Judy Smith and Rich Goldberg. We couldn't have done it without them. At jerrywilliams.com, you'll find a photo of Jerry Williams, me. You'll find links to newspaper articles about the Foundation for New Era Philanthropy case. There's a direct link to the American Greed episode. There's a mugshot of John Bennett. And of course, there is a link to my book, Greedy Givers, which was inspired by this case. I allowed myself to use my imagination to try to resolve some of those unanswered questions I had about John Bennett's motivation from going from a person who did such good work to somebody who ran a multi-million dollar Ponzi scheme. Greedy Givers is not a who done it, but instead a why done it. I hope you enjoyed the episode and that you'll share it with your friends, family, and associates. And please don't forget to subscribe to FBI Retired Case File Review at Apple Podcast or your favorite podcast app. My crime fiction recommendation for you is, of course, Greedy Givers, the second book in my FBI Philadelphia Corruption Squad series. But my advanced readers tell me that you can follow Greedy Givers even if you haven't read Pay to Play. I want to thank you for your support. Let me tell you Greedy Givers' premise. She believes he's a con man. He believes he's a victim of what happens when greed and giving collide. Special Agent Carrie Wheeler refuses to accept the hero label. Even after receiving the FBI and the City of Philadelphia's Medal of Bravery, She just wants to get back to work. Her new case has her investigating Cuthbert Cuddy Mullins, a self-described do-gooder who says he is changing the world for the glory of God. He's accused of running the largest charity Ponzi scheme in the country. As he attempts to convince everyone, wealthy philanthropists, donors, nonprofits, and even himself, that it's all a big misunderstanding. Carrie knows that she and Cuddy have something in common. They are both living a lie. He claims God gave him the gift to read troubled souls. Will he be able to read hers? Greedy Givers is available now at Amazon.com as an ebook and trade paperback. At this time, I don't do ads on the show, nor do I have a Patreon page. But you can support the podcast by picking up a copy of Greedy Givers or my first book, Pay to Play, about a female FBI agent investigating corruption in the Philadelphia strip club industry. 
available as an ebook, trade paperback, and audiobook. Thank you for your support. This episode was sponsored by FBIRetired.com, the only online directory made available to the general public featuring retired FBI agents and analysts interested in showcasing their skills to secure business opportunities. I want to thank you for listening, and I hope you come back again for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.